Hello, everybody, and welcome back to I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. And Gavin, have you ever talked to an old friend that you haven't heard from in a while? You know, I sure have, buddy. Recently, perhaps? Oh, you know, in fact, uh, maybe just like 30 seconds ago. Hey, guys. Fia is back. I'm How are back. You, Fia? I am doing good. How about you guys? Uh, better now that we get to hear your voice. Do you want to tell people what was going on while you were away on your sabbatical? Yes. Um, <laughs> so my sabbatical was not a fun sabbatical. And oh, no. uh, I've just been writing my thesis and trying to get everything ready because I'm going to be uh, defending my thesis this summer and then uh, quickly, promptly moving to Florida to start my PhD. That's that's a lot going on all at once. Yeah. Other, yeah. more different swamp. Yes. But I will be researching seagrass and sponges when I go to Florida. So no more swamp. Well, that's a, <laughs> it's a pretty good place for it. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So it is uh, nice to have Fia back. We expect Fia back uh, more regularly yes. uh, on the podcast here. But obviously, as circumstances come up, you know, we will make arrangements with the hosts as however we need. But it is good to have everybody back. So I'm not sure who's going to do this one, but uh, do we have some housekeeping to take care of? I don't think it's only right for uh, for Fia to take it back over. Yeah, I got this, guys. So uh, don't forget to rate the show on whatever platform you listen to. Uh, and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Give us feedback about the show and any future topics that you would like to hear on the podcast. And if you would like to be a guest on the show, which we would love to have, uh, please be sure to fill out our guest form. And all of this stuff can be found in the show notes. And then uh, before we get into the rest of the episode, Gavin, do you know what next episode's topic will be? I sure do. And it's going to be uh, a little bit of a weird one. Why? We are going to be talking about the Great Oxidation Event. Hooray. Which oh, is, yeah, that one. Yeah, you know. Every, you know, The, the Great egg. Oxidation Event. The. Yes. Yes. Uh, because, spoilers for, you know, two weeks from now. Uh, that is the first time that Earth got, like, actual oxygen. You know, yeah. <sighs> oxygen. Um, that one. So, uh, pretty important for yeah. just, you know, how life exists today. But that wasn't always the case. And we're going to learn more about that in a couple weeks. Very cool. Cool and deedy dandy. So, with that, uh, Mike, what happened today? But, you know, in the past. There's some like sports stuff, like you know, it was the day after uh, D Day, and like you, you can't do that because it's the day after. So, of course, yeah. June seventh in history, nineteen seventy nine. I'm just going to read this word for word here, um, without really much commentary. Rock and roll singer and uh, guitar legend Chuck Berry is tar- charged with tax evasion. Oh no! Okay, not exactly the worst thing Chuck Berry's ever uh, been accused of doing, but uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it's Chuck Berry, you know. Yeah, it's all I got. All right. Um. Uh, also, this day in history, in uh, you know, June seventh, nineteen sixty nine, my dad was born. So <gasps> happy birthday, Dad! I don't believe you listen to the podcast, but happy birthday! <laughs> yeah, happy birthday to him. Yeah, that but, uh, was the pretty swell thing you did uh, there. You know, twenty eight or so years ago, there, Gavin's dad. Well done. Twenty seven <laughs> is how old I am. I know, but you got to go back a little bit further than that. Yeah, so. no, touche, touche, touche. Um, nice. Cool. Awesome. So with Today in History done, Fia, do you have a returning Swamp Corner for us? I do. And uh, it's probably more exciting to me than it is for you guys because it is an amphipod that I would like to talk about. And nobody cares uh, real about quick. those. <laughs> real, real quick. Yeah. Of, of course I know. <laughs> well, what, what is an amphipod? <laughs> Uh, an amphipod is a invertebrate, uh, I want to say arthropod. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes, but I think that the ones you could probably see in New York are teeny tiny little bug thingies that live in the water. And uh, some people like to call them scuds. Because they're gross and disgusting, but I think do that they they're scuddle? Awesome. They do scuddle. They have they like kind of 
So they look kind of like a shrimp, but like more condensed and they don't have like a, a tail, a big tail like shrimp, but they flex their body back and forth to squiggle around. But anyway, this one particular one that I love very much is called Crophium Louisiana, which I found oh, out of course doing. You love the Louisiana one. All right. Okay, but yeah, that one. Uh, I found out that it has a new name and it's now Apaco Crophium Louisiana, which changed my world a little bit because I've been referencing it as something else. Uh, but. They're these cute little tiny uh, water invert that uh, is found in like brackish waters ranging from the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean region, and then southern parts of the west coast of North America. And these ones are cool because they have a huge gnarly antenna uh, in the front of their heads that um, they basically use to... Uh, burrow which is kind of cool because usually like amphipods they don't really they don't really have thick antenna like that so they kind of look like um they almost look like spider like not spiders they look like fangs they're so big Hmm. compared to the rest of their body and there's really not much out there on this species per se but their their family that they're in you know they use their antenna to burrow and then they're filter feeders, and they filter feed on detritus. Um, but the real the reason why I like these guys so much is because probably just the way they look. They're just cool looking, and I I have aspirations to one day get a tattoo of this species on my <laughs> finger, like on the inside of my finger, so that way, like when I move it, it like moves the way an amphipod would move. That's really uh-huh. cute. Yeah. One day. I'm still... I, I've just been thinking about it for a couple years now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after I finish my thesis. Awesome. Yeah, but that's that's it. It was good to have some Swap Corner again. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I believe we are ready to get on with the actual episode. Yeah. So, this, uh, this might be a long one. Uh, because today we're talking about the cr- uh, I almost said crustacean period. Uh, crustacean period. I did, I did look it up. Amphipods are crustaceans, uh, yes. and they are sort of shrimp and crab adjacent. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about the Cretaceous period, uh, the very famous for many many things. Uh, notably, it is the longest period of the whole Phanerozoic eon. So the entire time we've had complex multicellular life. Uh, this is the longest sort of subdivision that we've split this up into. Uh, but also, much more notably, uh, it is when all of the non-bird dinosaurs died. <laughs> that is Ooh. easily the most famous thing that, or most uh, famous thing that it's known for. So uh, let's talk about it. Um, and because it is the longest period, there is a lot to talk about. So this period started. 145 million years ago and ran until 66 million years ago. It always still really bothers me when I see things that say 65, like, like, uh, like pop culture things. Why? Because that's like the date that was like popularized by like Jurassic park. Oh, I see. Cause I, I think one of the taglines for the original Jurassic park was like, an adventure 65 million years in the making or something to that effect, oh, um, mm-hmm. which well, at you... the time we thought was correct. Right. So it's like for 1993, um, that might even have been like a tagline for the book. So in, the, in that case, like 1990, I, that was what we thought at the time. Now we have better technology. We have better ways to measure how long ago things were. And so we know that it is now 66, but uh, very recently, There was a movie with Adam Driver that I did not go watch called 65. Mm -hmm. uh, And it was about dinosaurs. And I was like, come on. At this point, you're trying to be wrong. (laughs) Uh, Which bothers me. Well, question I have for you, Gavin. Is there not like a range of like standard error that like this estimated number could be based on? Or is it a pretty hard set like... 100% confidence this is the the year. 
That is an excellent question. There is always error on this, and I'm actually going to do a quick Google and look that up. Actually, no. So mm. there is, I'm, I'm sure that there is an error on it. Yeah. But uh, all of the other ones that have error yeah. are listed as plus or minus. I think the smallest one, just looking through it really quickly, there's like a whole chart for this. Mm -hmm. um, the smallest error is uh, 0 0.024 million years. So that would be 24,000 oh. years. Okay. And that's yeah. plus or minus. So yeah. uh, if the chart shows them at that small, the right. end of the Cretaceous doesn't even have a plus or minus. Yeah. So it is 66.0 million okay. years ago. Right. I'm Like I said, I'm sure that there is some kind of error but on less that than in, in the sense that it was maybe might have been like 66 million and one years. Yeah. But right. for all intents and purposes, all intents and purposes, 66 million years ago. Cool. Thank you. Uh, also, this is rather timely because, uh, the second season of Prehistoric Planet on Apple TV Plus just came out. Uh, I watched it. It was quite good. I had the same uh, sort of problems with its educational value that I did with the first season. Um, if you have Apple TV Plus, I think it's worth a watch. It is very pretty. Um, but they don't explain almost anything about how <laughs> we know the things that they're talking about. It's basically just planet Earth, but dinosaurs. <laughs> um, so a lot of the things that they like speculate on which, you know, totally reasonable things to speculate is, you know, the, the way that they depict a lot of these dinosaurs, but uh, they don't explain that that's what they're doing. They just say, here's how it is. Take mm -hmm. it at face value because it's David Attenborough saying it. Um, uh. So minor gripes aside, it is at least very pretty. Um, but anywho, we're not here to talk about David Attenborough. No. <laughs> the Cretaceous period, like I said, famous for many things, including... Uh, if you listen to our episode about the Jurassic period, you'll know that it technically does not have an official start date. Which is nuts. Yeah, yeah it is the only boundary that has that. Um, and so for for just the, the a way we go about naming official things like this, boundaries between periods, it technically has not been ratified yet. But um, the everyone agrees it was 145 million years ago. Cool. Uh, as well as the Cretaceous is very famous for having pretty much all of the most famous dinosaurs. Um, for example, Tyrannosaurus rex was at the very end of the Cretaceous. Velociraptor was a little bit before that, but still at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, Triceratops, same place as T-Rex. Um, pretty much the only like ones that people could name that aren't from the Cretaceous are Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus, which may or may not even really be... Uh, a valid genus, but, um, and of course it is most famous for that big old mass extinction that yeah. ended up uh, wiping out all of those dinosaurs that we know and love. So what happened that made them die? Uh, we will get to that. That all will right. be how we end the episode in great uh, detail, because I feel like it is often just sort of said like, as I sort of have referenced probably, you know, dozens and dozens of times on this podcast, big rock hits earth, everything dies. And like, yeah, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, but I think it's important to learn the details about how that happens. Right. Because it is way more horrifying than you think. Oh, okay. Okay. But to start us off in the Jurassic period going into the Cretaceous, um, one of the reasons why it's hard to find the boundary between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous is because the Jurassic didn't have some kind of like big mass extinction at the end, something that would be obvious. Mm. And so because that's the case, the Cretaceous kind of started without too much fanfare, really. So at the beginning of the period is a little bit slow. Um, but as we go throughout the period here, we'll talk about some of the, uh, the climate stuff. Uh, also, for your own sanity, please do not go to the climate section of the Cretaceous Wikipedia page. Oh. <laughs> uh, it is an endless loop of acronyms that, like, I'm sure if you study these things, make sense to you. Mm -hmm. But, like, they'll name an acronym once, like, at the beginning of the section and then continually use it along with, like, eight other acronyms, all with, like, vaguely similar letters. 
And so it is just an incomprehensible mess. Uh, just save yourself. Just don't do it. Um, and also, okay, then. if you happen to be somebody who knows things about climate, please go fix it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of good things on like the paleo side of Wikipedia. This is not one of them. Um, but the climate basically started out pretty wet and pretty warm. Um, but not like crazy. So in the, in the past, we've had a, an episode about the Carboniferous period where the earth was just basically covered in rainforest, the whole, you know, planet over. Um, and this wasn't quite to that extent. So it wasn't rainforest everywhere. But if you think of sort of like the Northeast US where it's very foresty, but not rainforest, uh, kind of like that. Hmm. And uh, the tropics were pretty tropical, much more wet than the uh, you know, temperate regions. Uh, the climate was in general pretty warm, but it was cold enough that there was, and there, and there were actually continents toward the poles. So there were seasonal snowfalls uh, during the winter because, you know, at the poles, when it's their winter, they will go, depending on, you know, your latitude, months without sun. And so if that's the case, no matter how warm the planet is, you're going to get some kind of snow or freezing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. So in general, not quite total rainforest across the planet, but also not as relatively cold as we are today. Um, generally, from beginning to middle, it gets warmer and wetter, so more tropical, with some you know evidence of like cold snaps every now and then, uh, mm -hmm. and then toward the end, cools off and dries quite a bit. Um, and just for reference, uh, around the hottest part, so around the middle of the period. The sea surface temperature was somewhere around 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit compared to about 68 today. Oh, wow. So quite warm. Yeah. Uh, however, the uh, average polar temperature, so this is just, you know, air surface temperatures um, at the poles was 60 degrees, and, you know, annual temperature, which is... This uh, is freedom units right like fahrenheit freedom units yes Good. god that would be oh. horrible nothing would be alive <laughs> I just, want, just yeah. wanted to make sure here yes but thank you um something else about the climate is that it's kind of weird there was not a very large uh temperature gradient between the poles and the tropics at least like during the summer for the poles so that can really mess with climate because that temperature difference is why wind happens hmm. So if wind doesn't happen, uh, a lot of weird things happen with the planet, including uh, ocean currents don't really happen as much because the wind is mainly what drives ocean currents, or at least a, a big driver of it. So yeah. oceans were a lot less sort of mixed around the planet because these currents weren't as strong, and that leads to the ocean becoming what is called stratified. So it means that the ocean has different layers that are very distinct chemically. Um Whoa which just means that life has a harder time moving up and down throughout the ocean. Um, however, uh, that also isolates species, which means you get more species. Um, so very diverse time, despite, uh, you know, some weird funky chemistry stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, by this point, Pangea was basically fully broken up. Wow. Um, the continents didn't quite look like we have them today uh, throughout most of the period. That Toward the end, though, it does more or less look like a modern map uh, with a handful of exceptions. Like there's this big ocean running through the center of North America. Uh, Europe was a big chain of islands. Um, but location-wise, most things were pretty much where they uh, are today, uh, mm -hmm. if not a little closer to like the center. Uh Lots of mountain building because just because the continents aren't together doesn't mean they're not moving around doing a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, these were sort of the earliest days of, for example, the Rocky Mountains and the Andes Mountains, two of the largest mountain ranges uh, in the world today. Mm -hmm. Along with all this mountain building, when the continents move around, there was lots of magmatism, just lots of uh, volcanic eruptions. And oh. we will very briefly touch on one of them because... Some people are like, hey, maybe that killed the dinosaurs. Uh, and I, in the past, I've been like, a lot of things happened. But the more research I did on this uh, episode, 
Uh, no, it kind of just is the big rock. Um, other stuff was happening, but the big rock is kind of what did it. Mm-hmm. I see. So volcano probably not as impactful. Right. I, I'm sure it didn't help. Right. But was not sort of the the big stick that happened yeah. to to whack all of the all the life on the planet. <laughs> So, speaking of life on the planet, let's talk about some of the things that we're living at the time, starting with plants. Plants undergo an enormous change throughout the Cretaceous period. Angiosperms, which are basically any plant you can think of off the top of your head today, uh, 90% of plants today, Mm -hmm. uh, first show up probably sometime in the Jurassic, the genetic stuff is a little funky with them. Genetic things with plants in general is weird. Um, but that's kind of what it seems like is that they were around bef- a little before the Cretaceous, but once the, you know, we get into the, sort of the middle ish Cretaceous is when they start to do more well. Um, and then by the end of the Cretaceous and then after the extinction, they just really take over the entire planet. Um, this is thanks in large part to pollinators because we now had things like in, insects had been around for a really long time by this point, but now we had other things flying around, specifically birds. Um, birds were well, you know, on their way to looking very much like modern birds. Um, we'll talk more about them in a few minutes, but uh, most, if not all, of the non-angiosperm plants, so things like pine trees, um, like cycads, Things like that are Mm -hmm. wind-pollinated. I can't think of a single one that's not wind-pollinated. There probably is like one. But they don't have flowers, which kind of makes it hard to concentrate your pollen. Didn't you say earlier that this time period didn't really have that much wind? That's fair. That's a really good point. Um, I'm sure like there was still weather. But it was probably right. just much less severe. Yeah, okay. I got you. Um, I mean, it was probably enough to just blow pollen from, you know, tree to tree next to it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, that's that's a really good thing that I had, that I didn't think about. Nice. Um, potentially, there were even some pterosaurs that were doing some pollinating, although that's kind of speculative. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, we have lots of amber from this time period, so fossilized tree resin, not sap, uh, but resin is what makes amber. And uh, we got tons of uh, amber with in, of uh, that, that contains insects with pollen on them, on like fuzzy structures dedicated to collecting pollen. So wow. by the mid to late Cretaceous, this is definitely something that was happening. And... Uh, unlike today, where most plants, even you know whether it's trees or grasses or things like that, um, are angiosperms, by the end of the Cretaceous, it was pretty much still just the woody plants that angiosperms were doing. So things like grass, uh, which is probably the first like f- non-woody angiosperm that most people would probably think of, things like grass or certain things like... Um, like legumes and stuff like that, more Ooh. softer plants, um, were not really around by this point, at least as far as angiosperms were concerned. Mm-hmm. Most of that was still taken up by ferns, um, which to the to the non-plant people out there might not sound like a big difference, but it is a really big difference. Um, so that doesn't sound like a major shift, but I am not a plant person, so maybe I'm doing a bad job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I really can't overstate how massive the shift from non-flowering plants to flowering plants is. Because like I said, 90% of plants around today are yeah. angiosperms. And this shift happened during this time. Right. We also can't overstate how much Gavin is not a plant person. <laughs> no. As well. And I even considered doing a plant thing for next episode. But then I was like, I next couple of weeks are pretty busy. Uh, I don't have time to do a plants episode, <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, so 
Uh, actually, by the t- if you're listening to this on the day it comes out, Mike and I see each other tomorrow. Fun times. That is correct. I wish I was there. Yeah, we'll we'll get you next year for you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but yes, yeah, so moving on from plants to uh, the good life forms, animals. There is a really interesting phenomena that happens mostly in the Cretaceous, but also a little bit in the Jurassic, called the Mesozoic Marine Revolution, uh, where life in the seas basically changes from top to bottom. Um, modern mm-hmm. versions of sharks and rays first appear. Uh, the teleost group of bony fish, which is pretty much every you know, bony fish you can think of today. This is your, your, you know, your perch, your bass, your tuna, salmon, etc. cetera. Uh, that group takes over every niche in the ocean as well as uh, a lot of the stuff in freshwater as well. Sea stars, which I had never really thought about because they just seem like they've been around forever. <laughs> kind of. Um, but they become much more common on reefs and in deeper oceans during the Cretaceous. Uh, crustaceans, speaking of those uh, amphipods, become basically the same ones that we have today. Um, Even the microorganisms, so like there's the single-celled things doing photosynthesis, uh, change over to become very similar to what we have today. Wow. And so what are these changes that, like you say, make them closer to what we have today? Like the Um, structure? Mostly just like... What was that? The structure? Like their physical structure? No, um, like the like uh, relatedness, I guess. Oh, like genetically? Yeah, like so the, the groups that we have today split off and, and diversified around this time. Oh, okay. Gotcha. That's yeah. cool. Um, so things like all the, you know, single-celled guys floating around uh, in the oceans doing photosynthesis, those shift, uh, even the ones in freshwater shift to being similar to the ones we have today, or, or at least very, very similar groups. For example, the diatoms, which we've talked about a handful of times, um, which are very important in freshwater ecosystems today. Those really take off. I think they might even first show up here in the Cretaceous. I don't remember that for sure though. Um, and then even the tetrapods in the ocean were starting to become more similar to what we have today. We don't, obviously there are not whales at this time because mammals mm-hmm. hadn't really taken off. Um, but we see the first relatives of our modern sea turtles, uh, as well as some other giant sea turtles that are completely unrelated, uh, such as the, the two main ones you'll see are Archelon and Protostega, which have shells uh, the size of like a very large dinner table. <laughs> very big. That's, um, that's, that's absurd. Yeah. Um, so like 10 plus feet from like front to back was, is usually what you'll see, but I, um, that's, that's sort of the, the average size. I'm sure they could have gotten much larger. Um, and then as always, uh, there's lots of stuff that we don't have time for because the oceans are just crazy diverse. Um, but lots of stuff, mostly invertebrates, uh, were the things that didn't quite shift as much as the vertebrates did. Um, specifically, things uh, that we don't have around today, like ammonites, previously, as we've called many times, the swirly-shelled squid boys. Um, they were, at their by far, their most diverse. They were doing great throughout all the Cretaceous. Um, if you watch Prehistoric Planet 2, uh, like I said, that series on... Uh, Apple TV plus you will see lots of really, really cool ones because they weren't all just like a simple swirly shell. Some of them were like paper clip shaped where they had like gaps between all bits of the shell, but it was long and curled in on itself like a paper clip. Very strange. Yeah. Um, As well as lots of other weird shapes. Um. And then some of the older groups of invertebrates, like uh, brachiopods, crinoids, were still hanging around. Um, not as abundant as they are today, but, you know, uh, still kind of doing their thing and more important the ecosystem than they are today. Uh, speaking of whales previously, um, pretty much all the niches filled by whales and dolphins and even some sharks that we have around today uh, were filled by marine reptiles. These are things like your plesiosaurs, your long-necked, uh, you know, four-paddled uh, reptiles in the oceans. 
they were around for the whole period. Ichthyosaurs, which are much more sort of dolphin shaped uh, or fish shaped, as their name suggests, ichthyo means fish. Um, they were around at the beginning, but sort of go extinct in the middle. Uh, however, they were incredibly successful. They were around for well over 100 million years. Um, so they were doing great, and then all of a sudden they just kind of weren't. Hmm. Um, and but then toward the why? end of the period, uh, another group shows up called the Mosasaurs, which are great. They are actual lizards, unlike dinosaurs or plesiosaurs. These are actual lizards that grew to be the size of like the big predatory whales today. So these were doing the things of like orcas and sperm whales today. Um, but they also came in small varieties, little pocket sized 10 feet long uh, ones that were doing similar things to like dolphins. Pocket sized 10 feet long. Yeah. You know, <laughs> a giant pocket. Yeah, exactly. Like a kangaroo. Oh, <laughs> all right. So that's, that's the oceans uh, covered. Not in depth. Um, skimmed. As Lightly skimmed. The, the ocean, yes, the ocean was skimmed. Uh, you can never fully cover the ocean in anything yeah. just because there's so much to it. But uh, we have to get to the things that people are co- come to Paleontology Podcast listen to, which are uh, dinosaurs. the dinosaurs. But there I'm going to make you wait a little longer. Oh, Ooh. you can't do that. Yes, I can. We have to talk you can't about do that. Together. You can't like put it right in front of me like that and then take it away. I sure can, and I'm gonna. So, um, firstly, starting off with some stuff uh, up on land. Uh, we're going to start with insects, mostly because it's kind of hard to tell just because insects don't fossilize great. Um, but from what we can tell, most of the modern groups of insects first show up in the Cretaceous, even though they may have been around before that. So things like your ants and wasps um, start to do really well in the Cretaceous. Things like termites, butterflies, grasshoppers, all of those groups uh, start to do really well and diversify in the Cretaceous. Mammals? Are these... Oh, uh, I have a question. Are these yeah. insects, like, uh, abnormally larger than the insects nope. we have today? They're just, like, regular size? Yep, not at this time. Um, okay. So there's really only one period where that's really true, and that's the Carboniferous period. Okay, um, right. Because that was that was like a perfect storm for them, where it was like yeah. lots and lots of oxygen in the atmosphere because plants were doing all yeah. sorts of crazy things at the time. Plus, nothing was really around to eat them besides each other on land at that point, or at least like nothing major. Um, and so by this point, that's neither of those are true. There is more oxygen in the atmosphere than there is today during the Cretaceous, um, but not those crazy high levels. Cool. All right, so we're safe from yes. megabugs. <laughs> yes. Uh, mammals during this time were very much around and diversifying. Uh, and in certain like fossil deposits, they actually make up the majority of vertebrate fossils. Hmm. So most of them were very rat-like in shape. Um, but they did you know, a variety of things. Some were small carnivores. Some were totally herbivores. Um, there was one genus that was even very, very beaver-like and was aquatic mm-hmm. like beavers. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I don't think they were like eating wood the same way beavers do, but uh, they were doing something. I have a, a question actually very tangentially yeah. related to that, but just when we're talking about going this far back, how good of an idea do we know about the diet of these species? Like, can we tell they were they were carnivores, omnivores, herbivores. Can we tell more specifically like, oh, they ate this specific type of meat or this specific type, specific type of uh, plant? Just how, how, how much do we know about that? Um, it really kind of varies from species to species. So uh, some of the mosasaurs, I actually had this in the notes, but this is a, a long episode, so I, I didn't go through it. But um, right. for example, mosasaurs, I think completely were... Uh, carnivorous however some had teeth that were like very round and basically just like little uh the genus is called globodens which means globe tooth so they were like kind of globe shaped teeth uh and it was durophagus which means that it ate hard things mostly uh we think that it ate like the there were lots of species of like very large bivalves around at the time um 
So we think that that's probably what it ate for the most part. Um, whereas other mosasaurs had the typical sharp pointy teeth that you think of something that would be eating fish. Um, mm. So in that sense, yes. Um, in some others, um, it really is kind of tough to say, uh, particularly with reptiles because they replace their teeth so much. So it's like with mammals, you can tell really well okay. what it eats by looking at its teeth because for a weird thing with our genetics and our evolution, for the most part, we only get two sets of teeth. So you have to use those until you're going to die of old age, or you have to at least have the ability to do that. Um, right. So we do all sorts of funky things with our teeth, whereas reptiles, um, even if they're eating something really tough, they're going to grow new teeth soon enough anyway. And so that makes it a lot harder to tell. Right. For, you know, from us, you know, millions of years in the future. Right. And so um, you can also do some things. I And this is something that I know less about some of the chemical stuff, but different plants um, absorb carbon in different ratios, different isotopes uh, of carbon. And based yes. on that, you can tell. Um, I don't know how much of a thing it was at this time. Because what I mostly know that of is with grasses, because there are different kinds of grasses that do photosynthesis differently. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, you can tell how much grass it ate versus how much leaves it ate relative. Um, but I don't think that really works this far back because there wasn't that difference in how they do photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So good question. Um, it really varies from species to species. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, going back to the mammals, we had they they were doing all these different cool things. Uh, however, none of these were really our modern groups that we have still around today. Uh, for example, the monotremes, which uh, is the group that has five species around today, they're the ones that lay eggs. There's the four species of echidna as well as the one platypus. Uh, they were, the, the monotremes as a group were around, but not particularly common. So there was nothing that like looked like a platypus at this point. Um, we just know by looking at their teeth that they were related. Hmm. Um, and for the most part, they were just on Australia, South America, and then probably Antarctica as well. But we don't know. Um, at this point, um, those three continents were still very tightly connected. Um if not by like a chain of islands, dep depending on what reconstruction you look at, so they might have even still been touching in the case of uh, South America and Antarctica. But uh, in order to get from Australia to South America, you would have to go through Antarctica. So if they're on both, they were probably on Antarctica as well. Uh, the other groups of mammals that we have around today, the marsupials and then the placental mammals, which are everything else, um, they didn't really crop up as like true members of those group until like right at the very end. Um, and so there's a very, very common group that you'll see if you just look up Cretaceous mammals, um, that is neither of any of these three groups. They're called the multi tuberculates and they were wildly successful on the mm. Northern continents, especially. Um, and they filled basically every niche that small mammals do today. So everything from squirrels, that lived in trees and hopped around to things that like hopped around like kangaroo rats uh, to mm -hmm. things that burrow, like uh, not quite moles, but that kind of lifestyle. Um, mm -hmm. So you would say were... they're, they're kind of rat looking? Or rodent yeah. Looking? Um, like they, they kind of varied, but in general have a sort of rat like body plan. Okay. Um, but these were by far the most successful mammals uh, at the time of like over 200 species named. Um, so uh, I, I wish that I have got to work a little bit more with them because they seem like a really interesting group. Um, but with mammals done, onto the reptiles, but not yet the dinosaurs. We'll get there. <laughs> um, actually, I guess we'll start with some dinosaurs. Birds okay. were doing quite well. All right. Um, <laughs> birds were doing great. Some uh, had already, you know, despite being fully functional birds previously, they had evolved to lose their wings already and be fully aquatic. Uh, and some of them even lost their wings altogether. 
So these were uh, a group called the Hesperorniths, and they basically lived a lot like a loon, where they just sort of sat in the water and were diving birds. Uh, however, these did not have wings at all. They lived in the oceans and were diving predatory birds that uh, ate fish. So it just goes oh. to show how diverse birds were at this time. If there were even weirdos doing stuff like this, there were thousands of species of just regular, basically songbirds, as we would call them today, just little things like robins, chickadees, stuff like that. Not these actual groups, but things, birds doing the same thing as them. Um, although weirdly, many still had teeth. There are no birds with teeth today. If you have not noticed that, if you've, if you've never looked down a bird's uh, beak before, none of them have teeth. Uh, but at this time, they still did. Moving on from birds, pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, as most people call them, uh, were on the decline in general, but three families were doing pretty well. Um, first was the uh, Pteranodontidae, which Pteranodon is a very famous uh, large pterosaur. So this is the one that you see very much. It's got a very long beak with like a little spike coming off the back of its head. If you've seen oh, Land Before Time, that's what Petri <laughs> is supposed to be. Love that. Thank you for that. Um, however, Pteranodon itself was very big. Uh, had a wingspan of 22 to 25 feet, which would comfortably make it the largest thing flying around today. Um, very popular in media. They don't quite make it to the very end of the period, but they get pretty close. Uh, the second family is the Nyctosauridae, and they were very famous for having really large head crests hmm. and were maybe a bit smaller than that of Pteranodon, but not by a whole bunch. But the ones you'll see most commonly talked about with the Cretaceous is the family uh, called the Asdarkids. And there were other members that were smaller, but the ones you'll see a lot are Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsigopteryx which when they were on the ground were basically the size and rough shape of a giraffe. Wow. Yeah. Shape, uh, you said shape of a giraffe? Generally, yeah, because they have very, very long necks. Is it the same size as a giraffe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a giraffe, but with if its face was also like 10 feet long. <laughs> Maybe not quite 10, but very long. Point taken still. Um. However, this giraffe could stretch its arms out into a 35-foot wingspan and still very easily fly. Wow. Very strange animals. Um, and in particular, both of these spe uh, genus, Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsigopteryx, were shown quite well in this uh, that series, uh, Prehistoric Planet 2. Um I'm not shilling for Apple TV Plus. It's actually a very bad, hard-to-use <laughs> platform. But they do make very pretty documentaries. Um, getting closer to dinosaurs, sort of. Um, well, no. That was, that was a lie. Take that back. Crocodilians. Uh, oh. We're also doing great, including some terrestrial forms and even uh, an herbivorous terrestrial species. Mm, that's mine, a kind of crocodilian. Yeah, very, <laughs> very strange. Uh, that one was uh, on the island of Madagascar called Simosuchus. Um, hmm. And islands do weird things with evolution, which is probably why that guy ended up real weird. Yeah. Uh, there were also some real giants uh, for crocodilians at this time. So there's Dinosuchus, which was basically a giant alligator. Uh, Sarcosuchus, which wasn't quite a crocodile, but very crocodile shaped. Um, and both were in the ballpark of 30 to 35 feet long. And likely regularly ate some of the smaller dinosaurs. Uh, and for reference, the largest crocodilian today gets a little over 20 feet for, like, the biggest males. Yeah. So this was at least 50% larger. Mm hmm Snakes, more or less the same as today. Likely not venomous yet. So there, I don't believe we found any evidence for venom in snakes at this point. Um, is that the kind of thing we would have seen evidence for? Yeah, you can see where their um, venom gland goes on the skull. Snake skulls are very strange. Um, okay, but so you'd also be able to evidence see is evidence of absence here. Right. Um, although, to be fair, most of the snake fossils from this time come from vertebra. 
So that would be kind of hard to tell. Um, so I don't know that for sure, but that is sort of the consensus that I kind of saw. Um, although from the handful that we do have more bodies of, uh, many of them likely still had very tiny vestigial hind legs. Hmm. Yeah. Snakes are weird. Um, yeah. Lizards diversify into the groups that we, we see today with geckos, monitor lizards, skinks, iguanas, all likely around uh, in some form during the Cretaceous. And finally, the dinosaurs. Hooray. Fine. <laughs> Dinosaurs were at their peak during this time, both in size, shape, lifestyle, uh, location, and, of course, species. And keep in mind, throughout the rest of this little bit here, uh, the largest land animal today is the African bush elephant, which is six to eight tons, with the largest male ever recorded at around ten tons. So just keep usual six to eight largest ten tons. Theropods, so these are your uh, two-legged meat-eating dinosaurs. They were both the largest and the smallest they have ever been. Smallest <laughs> meaning birds, because birds are theropod dinosaurs. But also, they were just doing lots of, you know, small small little guy things. Things like Velociraptor, or even smaller. Uh, Velociraptor, like a, a good-sized Velociraptor, would probably come up to your hip. If not, most of them probably your knee. Um, so, roughly chicken-sized. Um, however, they also had many large members, not just including things like T-Rex. So each continent kind of had its own. So in North America, there was Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, in Africa throughout the Cretaceous, uh, there was Spinosaurus and Carcharodontosaurus, uh, in South America, there was Giganotosaurus and a handful of others all hit probably the eight to ton, eight to 10 ton range and about 40 to 45 feet in length. Wow. So this is a very large elephant, but stretched. Yeah. <laughs> very different body proportions than an elephant. Uh, as I mentioned, there were some like the dromaeosaurs, which is the actual name for things like Velociraptor, as well as uh, another family that's closely related called the Trudontids, that uh, were only a handful of pounds, uh, maybe three to four feet long, mostly eating bugs, lizards, and small mammals and things. Uh, many, if not most, theropods by this point had feathers of some kind, um, including some fairly large ones like uh, the genus Eutyrannus in Asia, which was about 20, a little over 20 feet long. Sauropods were also at their largest. These are your big, long-necked, uh, giant dinosaurs. Uh, mainly by this point in the Cretaceous, the titanosaurs. Uh, mostly in South America and Africa, but with some in uh, Asia and North America as well, but less common. Um, these were some of the giants like Argentinosaurus in South America uh, at about 100 feet long and somewhere between 80 and 100 tons. Jeez. So that is, wow. one of these is, a, you know, a herd of elephants. <laughs> Easily. Yeah. So... Uh, you'll, you'll often see if you just quickly Google what is the largest dinosaur, most of the time it'll come up as Argentinosaurus. However, there were, you know, probably close to a dozen at least that were around the same ballpark size. So this was not at all just like a, a one that was gigantic. There were a few of them. Hmm. Uh, as well as obviously if, if there's that many giant ones, there's many, many more smaller ones. Um, and by smaller, I mean, I think, like, the smallest sauropod is the size of, like, a really big cow. So still pretty big. Yeah. Uh, the hadrosaurs, which are sort of the duck-billed dinosaurs, were also real. This was, again, their most diverse time. Uh, the largest being Shengtungosaurus in China at around 50 feet long and uh, 14 to 16 tons, which is considerably larger than uh, the largest predator in the area, uh, which was marginally smaller than Tyrannosaurus rex, not by a lot. Hmm. Ceratopsians, so things like Triceratops, uh, were also 
again, they, they pretty much live their whole lifespan in the Cretaceous as a group, um, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. But they had multiple members in the eight-ish ton range, uh, things like Triceratops and Taurosaurus. Um, they had medium ones in the two to four ton range, like Styracosaurus, which has this single giant horn coming off of its nose, as well as spikes all around its frill. It's a really cool looking one. It looks like the uh, the Iron Throne in Game of Thrones. Um, and they even had sort of like medium dog sized ones, uh, like Protoceratops and Cetacosaurus, all just running around being herbivorous and, uh, you know, fighting each other with their head frills, probably. Uh, their cousins, the Pachycephalosaurus, uh, you might know them as sort of the headbutt dinosaurs, um, they, despite being very popular in media, only were around for like 20 million years at the end of the Cretaceous. Mm-hmm. And really only in a couple places. They're just kind of weird, which is why they're around in media a lot. Uh, lastly, the Stegosaurs, so things like Stegosaurus, uh, had pretty much gone extinct by the middle of the Cretaceous, but their cousins, the Ankylosaurs, or sort of the tank dinosaurs, like the club-tailed dinosaurs, uh, they sort of replace them as the period goes on as sort of the, the heavily armored herbivores. And then by the end of the period, they, they're doing pretty well. And all of those last few minutes is literally just scratching the surface of dinosaurs. I could go on and on and on about dinosaurs because we've studied them so much. Um, and we have lots of information about them, but uh, we're moving on because dinosaurs, uh, dinosaurs are a little overrated. Uh, it's, it's historically <laughs> not a uh, uh, not our thing on this podcast. No. So, despite being at the height of their diversity, um, maybe there are actually a couple of studies that suggested we've talked about this before on the show that suggested that dinosaurs were starting like on a decline a little bit at the very end of the Cretaceous period. Uh, the data for that, in my opinion, aren't good because we don't have a lot of rocks from that time that have dinosaur fossils in them outside of North America. There are some from China as well, but especially like Southern hemisphere, we just don't have the information. So it's kind of hard to make a statement like that, but uh, thought I'd throw it in here. Regardless of how it happened, whether they were doing great or whether they were kind of on the decline, all of that diversity did have to come to an end because clearly we don't have giant dinosaurs running around today. So Which how did that happen? It is, well, we wouldn't have happened uh, if, if that was still the case. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a pretty good argument to be made that's a worthwhile trade. Yep, uh, touche. That is uh, that is certainly an opinion. My favorite part about that is you had no idea how to respond. That I was like, yep, all I right, sure moving didn't. on. Yep, I sure did not. <laughs> uh, so, as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, most people generally know the gist of what happened big rock hits earth everything dies and as i mentioned that both is and is not quite the case so around 66.0 million years ago a meteorite hit the ocean in what is now the gulf of mexico uh looking through the internet at ufia yeah (laughs) so this asteroid was somewhere between six and nine miles wide and left a crater 110 miles wide and 12 miles deep. In the Gulf still? Or you can't see it anymore? I mean, it's mostly infilled with sediment by this point, but... Oh, yeah, probably. Um, And just for reference, for how big, not even the crater, just the asteroid itself... That would make it roughly the size of like a small to medium city. So, for example, it's about 50% bigger than the city of Syracuse. Um, And then also, uh, just like land area wise, based on its diameter, uh, it would have been slightly larger than the island of Manhattan. So, like, this is the kind of movie or kind of thing that in the movie Armageddon, like, oh, yeah, trying to. Okay. Which, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie Armageddon, great, great movie. movie. Science. Awful science. Great movie. Yeah, great science movie. not great. <laughs> uh, great movie, though. So, um, 
I will not go into great detail of how the crater was discovered, but it is actually, it is worth the Google. Uh, I promise. So, um, but in short, basically a pair of researchers found uh, a layer of iridium, which is a, a, a chemical element on the periodic table, but is very common in space and very rare on earth. Like you find it in trace amounts and like volcanic ash and things, but this was at like dozens of times the levels that you would find it in a volcanic eruption. So, uh, they were kind of like, huh, must have been a thing that happened. Um, and they found it sort of at what had already been established as the boundary between the Cretaceous and the following period, the Paleogene. And so they had proposed in a paper in uh, 1980 that, that that a big asteroid hit the planet and a that that's what killed the dinosaurs. Uh, however, no crater had been found by that point. And so it's kind of hard to be like, yeah, this happened. We have not great evidence for it, uh, especially for something like that, where it's, it's, you know, dinosaurs even back then were very popular. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say this is what did it without, you know, the smoking gun. Hmm. And in 1981, so a year after that paper was published, uh, an international meeting was held to sort of gin up money and attention to find this crater. That same week that that uh, meeting was held, a geologist at the Mexican state-owned oil company named Glenn Penfield was presenting research from the Gulf that he thought sure looked a lot like a crater at a different conference. <laughs> but because all the other all the people that were interested in this kind of thing went to that other conference, they all missed it. Oh no! Um, <laughs> and so it wasn't until uh, 1990 when a local journalist from uh, Texas who had just kind of happened to bump into the right people who had been uh, like this journalist was at the, the talk that this uh, Mexican geologist gave. Uh, and then, you know, almost 10 years later bumped into somebody that was looking for the crater and was like, Hey, have you talked to this guy? And then they did. And then in 1991 is when they published the, the paper. So uh, 10 years after the, uh, geologist with the Mexican state-owned oil company uh, gave that talk. I wonder so it's if it's a, a series of uh, a comedy of errors. Yeah. And so that was what gave it the name, the Chicxulub Crater. They named it after a nearby town on the Yucatan Peninsula there. And so we now have our smoking gun. We now know very well that a, a giant rock hit the Earth. 66 million years ago. What happens when that happens? A lot. There's a reasonable question to ask. (laughs) Because it's like, well, clearly, this killed all the dinosaurs. But we haven't seen this happen, so what? how do we figure out what this does? It's kind of hard to observe that kind of thing. So, firstly... There's the actual impact itself. Uh, This would have obviously been really bad for anything in the nearby area, to say the least. Yeah. Uh, And in fact, in the nearby surrounding several hundred miles, uh, pretty much everything was vaporized instantly. Wow. Uh, Because the asteroid hit water, uh, even though the crater does extend onto land on the Yucatan Peninsula, um... It, it hit water itself, and that created tsunamis over 300 feet tall. However, that's mostly because it hit relatively shallow ocean in the Caribbean. Uh, it was still shallow back then, just it's relatively shallow now. Uh, if it had hit deep ocean, it's likely that those tsunamis would have been almost three miles high. Wow. Yep. Overall... This impact itself had about a billion times more energy than the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Japan in World War II. And that is billion with a B. (laughs) It's hard to even fathom that. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's one of those things. It's hard to fathom. It's hard to imagine because like, of course we can't. And right. Exactly. Like, yo. Us imagining that is imagining the end of civilization. Oh, um, for sure. The you know the end of you know your most life as we know it. To you know to use a cliche phrase. Yeah, absolutely. 
you know, I, I, and I know that might be good, like clinical to think about, but like, of course we cannot imagine that. Yeah. Right. So that is, that is the impact itself. And then in the immediate aftermath, so I'm talking, you know, a handful of hours after the impact, everything gets real hot. So the impact shoots rocks up out into the atmosphere, whether it's pieces of the Earth's crust or pieces of this asteroid itself, shoot back up into the atmosphere. Some of them even make it all the way back out into space. Wow. Uh, however, the ones that don't make it to space then have to fall back down. And normally, mm. once something enters Earth's atmosphere, it just burns up. Um, and when it's just one thing at a time doing that, that is just a, a completely negligible impact on the atmosphere as a whole. When it is millions to billions of things doing this all at the same time, that instantly skyrockets global temperatures just from the friction of these things moving through the atmosphere. And so this would have set many forests on fire, basically just around the world from just the atmosphere cooking things alive. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, like I said, this would have only lasted a couple of hours, but would have killed millions to billions of animals and plants all across the planet. Um, and I will say very quickly, uh, this is kind of hypothesized. Uh, there's not a whole lot of soot known from this. So if this did happen, uh, there there is some like soot, uh, you know, preserved in the rocks from here, but not as much as you might think from something like this happening. So it is hypothesized, but not a ton of evidence for it. But to me, it just sort of intuitively makes sense. Yeah, I can see it. All right. So we are now a, a handful of hours after the impact The heat, you know, there are no more things in the atmosphere uh, producing that heat. So the heat sort of dissipates. Um, and then in the following couple of years, things get cold. And so the amount of ash and How debris cold. in the atmosphere would have blocked out the sun and reduced global temperatures by about seven degrees almost instantly after those, uh, you know, three or four hours of intense heat. And by seven degrees, okay. I mean, like, from what it was before. And is that seven degrees might not deal? sound like a lot, but currently we're freaking out over about two degrees temperature change i guess yeah and that's over the span of like a century this is over the span of like a week right so this like i said would have lasted for about three years and would have taken closer to 10 for the dust to settle completely um so the the full ash and dust cover of the atmosphere about three years and then it's gradually would uh clear for the following seven years after that. Um, however, you know, all of that blocking dust, blocking out the sun, but that just reflects sunlight back out into space instead of it coming to the surface of earth like it would. So that's what decreases temperatures. However, there's also a gas aspect of it. Cause just as there are greenhouse gases that we talk about with climate change today, like carbon dioxide, and methane that trap heat in, there are also gases that reflect the heat back out. And wouldn't you know it, where the rock hit, there was a lot of sulfuric uh, materials in the rocks. And sulfuric gas is one of those things that reflects the sunlight back out. So even after the dust had settled, um, there was still some gas in the atmosphere reflecting sunlight back out into space. Wow. Uh, not only that, sulfur makes sulfuric acid uh, when combined with water. And made really horrible acid rain during this time. So bleak. Very bleak. This this is literal apocalypse stuff. Um, but I mean, yeah. yeah, right. This is this you know kind of goes deeper into the whole like is more than just big rock hits. Right. Or like there is you know a chain reaction 
you're the world's worst uh, Rube Goldberg machine is at work here. Exactly. Um, and so all of this combined, the lack of sunlight, like I said, for the you know, total lack for like three years and then much less sunlight for the following, you know, decade or so. Um, really bad for plants. You know, plants kind of need that. Uh, and because the plants needed the sunlight but weren't getting it, that's bad for the herbivores. And then that's bad for the carnivores that would eat them. So even the ones that did serve, even if there wasn't any of that burning up atmosphere or superheating that I was talking about, because there are people who say that that wasn't as much of a thing, um, this just total ecological collapse caused by the lack of sunlight um, would have probably comfortably been enough to, to cause a mass extinction. So we are now, give or take 10 years after the impact not 10 million years 10 actual experience you know most people listening to this hopefully are above 10 um <laughs> you've experienced a decade that's how long we have been since the uh impact by this point in our story then it gets hot again because those rocks again that the asteroid hit were limestones and while they contained a lot of sulfurous material Limestone is mostly made up out of carbon. And so, just like all that sulfuric stuff was vaporized by the impact, so was all of that carbon. However, uh, sulfuric acid is very easily rained out of the atmosphere just by normal weather and rain. Um, that's why all the acid rain happens. But carbon is much trickier to get out of the atmosphere, so that hung around for a lot longer. So once the dust settled and then all the sulfur rained out of the atmosphere, there was a ton of extra carbon in the atmosphere that raised global temperatures again quite quickly uh, after about a decade. Wow. And so that sort of sets up our tale of my next bullet, who died? <laughs> um, everyone. And, well, surprisingly, not everyone. Oh. Beatles, I assume, made it. Yeah, you know, beetles. Uh, I actually have a bullet in here that I'll talk to about insects. Uh, that's really, it's very difficult to tell. Um, but so in general, somewhere around 55% of all plants species go extinct. Uh, however, around 75% of all animal species go extinct. Uh, this includes all of the non-bird dinosaurs, the ammonites, those swirly shelled squid boys, and then all of the big marine reptiles. Uh, so this would be the plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, um, pterosaurs the the flying reptiles go extinct uh, as well as a couple of uh large amphibian groups that i didn't mention before because they were pretty much only living in, in antarctica by this point um mm. but it's a very like large amphibian group so like the size of like salamanders basically crocodile sized um but they were hanging on just barely from you know times long past even by this point but this is what finally did some of them in um so those were pretty much the only groups that like totally went extinct as for like large scale groups, which were basically the backbones of every ecosystem, but not, you know, major, major diverse groups like different groups of insects, for example. Um, and something that is really easily noticeable if you look at the things that went extinct and things that didn't across this extinction um, is th there are some very noticeable patterns. So firstly, if you were on land, if you were over about 50 pounds, you're done. <laughs> uh, is there a reason why that is like, why is it that there was a specific weight that was a cutoff? Mostly a uh, bigger body needs more food. And if and all your wasn't foods, enough to go, okay. yeah, if all your food's dead, you know, you're not getting any more food. <laughs> There were a couple of exceptions to this, but all of them were aquatic, like uh, living in lakes and streams and things. Um, for example, turtles and crocodilians generally did pretty okay. Um, each of them only dropped by about 15 to 20%, which is still a lot and noticeable on like, you know, much more than just sort of background extinction rates. But uh, compared to a lot of other things, they did pretty okay. Uh, in the oceans, 
uh, if you lived in shallow environments or if you made a shell out of calcium, your life was really hard. Mostly from that acid rain. Right. Uh, if you lived in more open water, so like not quite the deep oceans because the deep oceans got pretty anoxic uh, around this time. So just no oxygen in the deepest parts of the ocean. But if you lived in like open waters, you generally did okay. Uh, so long as your food source wasn't making their shell out of calcium. Yeah. Uh, many mosasaurs were thought to have eaten ammonites and things, but because they make their shell out of calcium and they went extinct, uh, so did the mosasaurs. However, things like sharks and rays do generally pretty well. Only a couple of families go extinct. Uh, birds did generally okay. Um, it, it's kind of a common misconception that like dinosaurs turned into birds to not go extinct. But like I said, birds had been around comfortably for like 50, 60, maybe even closer to 100 million years by this point. Um, however, lots of bird group... You know, even though birds do okay, lots of bird groups go extinct. So uh, pretty much the only ones that survive are our modern group of birds. So all the weird ones with teeth and uh, doing some weird things that we don't see in birds today, all of those go extinct, leaving just our birds. Uh, mammals, in general, did pretty okay, mostly because of that sort of size bias. Like I said, uh, there just weren't very many large mammals. However... Uh, any mammal that was strictly carnivorous or strictly herbivorous went extinct. Only the omnivores, like, survived through the extinction. I guess that makes sense, because they can Yeah, you, be in, in a time like this, you, you can't afford to be picky about yeah. what you're making. <laughs> uh, insects seem to have been hit rather hard but like i said it's kind of difficult to tell the main way that i saw this sort of quantified was by looking at fossilized leaves with like traces on them of like a, a caterpillar or something eating it and looking at you know different insects eat leaves in different ways with different shapes and by looking at the diversity and you know uh, different types of these you know, bite patterns essentially on these leaves, you can see, just get a sense for like their general diversity. Now, like, I don't think that's a great way to do it, but if that's the only data you have to work with, then that's all you got. Right. Um, yeah. So it seems like they were hit relatively hard and took, you know, a few million years to sort of recover to that same level of uh, chomping diversity that they reached before. Plants. Uh, like I said, 55 or so percent go extinct. However, that's what really opens the door for angiosperms to do really well afterward and become everywhere like we see them today. Um, fungi, on our on our last note, fungi did great. <laughs> There's what we call a uh, fun like I, I believe it's called a spore spike or a fungal spike uh, at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh which is pretty much just because there was a lot of dead stuff around. Yeah. Uh, you know, when, when your whole job is decomposing dead stuff, you see that asteroid come to Earth and you're like, oh, what's that meme of like the guy looking out behind the tree rubbing his hands together? That's fungus right, here, right now. Um, so they're, they love this kind of thing. And so all said and done, this leaves Earth's ecosystems radically different than before uh, with the plants being totally different, which we hadn't really seen through a mass extinction before. We've seen different groups of plants transition from one to the other before, but not with like a major event like this, really. Uh, the animals being totally different going from, you know, archosaur dominated with the, the dinosaurs, crocodilians, pterosaurs being the major player in basically every environment to kind of just no one being the major players for the first couple of million years. And then we see mammals really start to take off into the uh, Paleogene period, which we will talk about in the future sometime. Very cool. And that's, uh, that's all we've got to say here about the Cretaceous period. That's a lot. Any, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
any uh, closing thoughts for us on uh, Total Armageddon, Mike? I mean, it is, you know, I, it, this was one of the episodes where I didn't have much to say throughout the whole thing, just listening to everything as it was happening. Like, this is part of the reason why I like this show, is just being able to hear about the cascade of things, about the why and about what happened before. And, um, like, it's, you know, like, I think you said it best, it's more than just big rock hits the earth. And I think everybody kind of knows that inherently, but getting that spelled out for you and getting the, you know, kind of the blow by blow or as close to the blow by blow as we can get, like, that's like wildly interesting and informative. Um, and so the, uh, I mean, that's why I like this show. That's why I like doing the show is getting that kind of in-depth, long form look at you know, topics along those lines. Oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah. Um, I will say, and this is something I should have pointed out uh, a little bit earlier. So as bad as all of that sounded, <laughs> you know, me describing all of that, uh, this is not even really all that close to the worst mass extinction. Oh. Yeah. It, uh, out of sort of the quote unquote big five that you see very often, this is probably n- number three right in the middle. Uh, We've talked about the two worst ones before, the end Permian, where, uh, depending on how you look at it, somewhere at minimum 95% of all species went extinct. And then the other one, it's a little weird because it wasn't that long after that one, so things hadn't totally recovered, but the end Triassic mass extinction, uh, where maybe like 80% of things went extinct, again, depending on how, what what numbers you're looking at, but... uh, Yeah, so this is, despite all of that, uh, 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 life finds a way. Sure does. But yes, I think that's that's all the talking that I want to do for today. So Mike, bring us home. That was quite a bit. um, And part of the reason why we were able to do uh, the episode this week was because both Gavin and I will be doing quite a bit of talking uh, over this coming weekend. So with that, Gavin, I'm looking forward to seeing you this weekend. And until then, this has been episode 113 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Gavin. And Fia, thank you so much for coming back. It was wonderful to hear your voice and have you back on the podcast to pick up my slack today. Until then, we will see all of you guys in two weeks. Take care, everybody.